Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today I bring to you another teaching of the Kerigma. And the teaching that we are going to give you today is about Satan and his works and his deceptions. We are going to begin with the reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians. And it is from chapter 1, verse 13. He says, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. And he is telling us that, telling us that God transferred us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son, that is, into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Here, we can remember one of the uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. In this particular spiritual exercise, he asks that we should imagine, in, our, in using our imagination in our prayer, a, a, a field and two opposing armies and two uh, banners. And then he, he says that on one side is the evil one with his banner, and on the other side is Jesus Christ with his banner, and they are prepared for battle. And so in the meditation of St. Ignatius, he says that we need to choose a side. We cannot be only spectators. We need to either follow Jesus Christ or follow the ways of the evil one, and that we have to make a decision. And that is one of the purposes, that is one of the goals of the Kerigma, is that each one of us can 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 come to this point where we make a decision and hopefully we decide after uh, thinking about it uh, we decide with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our being we decide to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and to follow him and to obey him and also to fight for him to to live this life in in a way that shows that we are soldiers of Christ, that we are uh, fighting for the good and that we are fighting for, for, for Jesus, that we are following him, that we are obeying him and against all the enemies of God, which are also our enemies. So that's why we are going to begin. Um, this is the scripture uh, that will begin our teaching today. He, he brought us out of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Now, the teaching is, of course, about Satan and his works and his deeds. So the first thing that we need to understand is who is Satan and what is Satan? What is Satan? Satan is not a god, even though in the meditation of the two kingdoms, we can, we can think that he is a rival to God, but he is by no means a rival to God. Why? Because Satan is a fallen angel. And because he is an angel, he is a creature. Therefore, in relation to God, Satan is a creature. God is the creator. Now, how, how come he became evil? He did not became, uh, become evil uh, because God made him evil. He became evil out of his own choice. Because he's an angel, he has a will that cannot um, wobble like ours. You know, one day we want something, one day we want something else. But but angels, because they their perfection, the perfection of their being, is that they have <clears throat> a will that is strong. And once they make a choice, they don't change. Uh, so that's that's what happened to Satan. He there was a point of choice, and he chose to rebel against God. And that choice is irreversible. In the, cha in the, in the case of angels, choices are irreversible. So that's why Satan is not that God cannot forgive him, is that Satan cannot repent. He is set in his course and he chose to be against God. Uh, so the first point that we need to understand then is that Satan is a fallen angel, fallen by his own will and by his own choice, and that he is in no way a rival to God. That God is a creator, he's a creature, and um, God is... Um, um, God is God, and he is not. <laughs> you know, that's that, that simple. Uh, another point that I want to make about Satan in relation to God is that Satan is powerful by 
but it is not all powerful. It is powerful because of the perfections and the powers that God had bestowed on him for being an angelic creature. Uh, and this um, attributes that he has for being an angelic creature he still has them but they are perverted and he uses them uh, for evil <clears throat> so yes he's powerful but he is not all powerful he is also very intelligent but by no means he is um, om omniscient like God is. God is omniscient, that is, he knows everything, but the devil doesn't. He is very intelligent, but he doesn't know everything. Another uh, point is that God could be, God is present everywhere. That's what we call he is omnipresent, omnipresent, but the devil is not. The devil could be present, but he could not be present as well. The devil is, um, is not like God, is not as God in, in any way. In, in the way that um, he, he's in a total different category. I mean, who can who can be like God? You know, like the very name of Saint Michael means who who is like unto God? Nobody, nobody. And but another point important that we need to understand about the devil is that he is a personal being. He is a person. He is not just a negative energy, or he is not just a negative vibe. He is indeed a person. A, a spiritual person, but a person nonetheless. Now, who is Satan in relation to man, in relation to human beings? He is more powerful than any human being uh, on its own. Uh, why? Because in the order of creation, angels are higher in the hierarchy of creation. They are pure spirits spirits they have an intelligence and a will that are far more superior than the will and the intelligence of men and besides we are fallen creatures <laughs> we have all these weaknesses uh, due to our sin but uh, but this is the first point that the devil is more powerful than any other human being than any human being um, I should say okay and he is a tempter uh, we can see that even in the gospel, how he even dared to tempt our Lord Jesus Christ in the desert. And he is constantly tempting us, tempting us, which means that he is inviting us to disobey God and to distrust him, the, the, uh, uh, to sin. He is always inviting us to sin, to separate ourselves from God. And... Um, uh, one thing about temptation is that we need to understand that we will not fall into any temptation. Uh, the, we, we are always free uh, to, to reject temptation, but we need to reject it ourselves. We need to make that choice. Uh, the devil cannot make us do anything, even though some people like to say, oh, the devil made me do it, the, the, the devil make, made me do this, the devil made me do that, the devil, the devil made me fall. Uh, that is just not true. Uh, it, it, I, I, had a, I had an experience with one of my uh, of my uh, my good people that I have uh, ministered through the years and he he was not even baptized at the moment uh, eventually he entered the Catholic Church but he was not even baptized and he told me that he said you know the other day somebody said that you know ah, the devil made me do it the devil made me fall and um, and I you know sister I don't think that's true you know when I sin I sin, you know, and I thought that was so so wise of of him, uh, because because it is true. When we sin, we are the ones that make the choice. We we when we uh, of course because we are sinners, we like to blame somebody else all the time, and how expedient to have the devil that I can blame on him my poor choices, uh, but that is uh, that is just not true. The devil cannot make me do anything. He invites us, but we are the ones that accept the invitation when we fall into the temptations. So. That's why we pray in the Our Father every day, deliver us from, from temptation, Don't lead us not into temptation. Okay, another uh, point about the devil is that he is a liar and a father of lies. This is from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 8, verse, verse 44, when the, Jesus is having this uh, amiable discussion, it's actually a very nasty discussion with, with some of the Jews. And um, and he is saying, 
<laughs> when he says this to the Jews, you, know, you are of your father the devil, and you will do as your father uh, as your father desires. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And um, and that is uh, that is his nature. His nature is to be a liar and a murderer. He desires to kill you. He desires to kill me, not only for this life but for eternity. And he, if to to do that, he uses lies and deceptions, and he is constantly trying to make us turn our backs on God. That is to to betray God uh, by sin and to um, to fall into temptation. Uh, either by disobeying God or by la by lacking uh, in trust in God, by, by distrusting God. Okay, so the, this is the nature of the devil. He's a liar, he's a murderer, and he desires our destruction. Uh, the good news is that we do not have uh, to fall for, for the devil. The good news is that we have it in our power to be uh, delivered uh, from the devil, not, not really in our power as human beings, but we, we have it in our power to choose whom we are going to serve. And if we serve Jesus, then he will deliver us from the evil one uh, through a life of holiness, through a life of um, receiving grace in the sacraments, and we will be delivered from evil in our lives. But let's examine three ways by which we out of our own choices, bad and poor choices that we make sometimes, how these three ways we place ourselves in the dom under the dominion of darkness, under the dominion of evil. And these three choices, I, the first one is sin, uh, which we already talked about in the previous teaching. Uh, the second one, uh, the second and the third one, they are also sins, but uh, we are going to talk about them specifically in this teaching in regards to, to, the, to the devil. Uh, is first of all, uh, resentment, holding grudges, that is refusing to forgive. That is, uh, <clears throat> that is the second way by which we place ourselves in the kingdom of darkness. And the third way is by engaging in occult practices, superstitions, and any spiritual practice on the um, on the margin of God that is uh, against God in a way that is not according to God's will. So let's see the the, the first part of this teaching. Uh, as I said already, we saw the, already the teaching on sin, but now we're going to see about forgiveness, or I should say lack of forgiveness, resentment. Uh, forgiveness is an absolute absolute necessity to receive the mercy of God. We cannot expect God to be merciful to us if we are not merciful to one another. So that is uh, one of the Christian teachings and in fact is the Christian teaching that is the most challenging of them all. Uh, let alone his teaching on purity and let alone his teaching of marriage, uh, but his teaching on forgiveness is the most radical of all the Christian teachings. Uh, he made it very clear through his life, especially through his death and resurrection, and, and through his teaching. He always made it an absolute necessity that in order for us to receive God's mercy, we ourselves need to practice mercy. Uh, this is, um, in the case of Jesus, we can see how when he was dying, he prayed for his executioners and he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And indeed, that was the truth. And, and this, is, um, this is the pattern of the Christian to follow Jesus, to follow in his footsteps. And when we are wrong, when somebody sins against us, we need to forgive. And this doesn't mean doesn't mean that we approve of the actions. The fact that Jesus died on the cross didn't mean that he was okay with our sins. Uh, it is more that he, he acknowledges the gravity of sin and we acknowledge the gravity of sin, but we extend mercy. We forgive. 
We don't give what, what, what is due, but we give that which is not deserved, and that is mercy. And that is the same thing that we receive from God. Because we do not deserve mercy, mercy is something that is graciously given to somebody who doesn't deserve it. And that is, um, that is the same pattern for us as Christians. So we need to forgive. When we forgive somebody, we do it uh, not only for their, for their sake, but above all, for our own sake. What, what does that mean? That means that when somebody commits a sin against me, I am very much tempted to commit sins also against me. Because when I refuse to forgive, when I hang on to my resentment, that is a way that I am hurting none other but myself. Because uh, the, there are many images, but you can think that uh, when I refuse to forgive, is like I am taking this poison hoping that the other person dies. When I refuse to forgive, when I hang on to my resentment, I am really hurting myself. That is a sin that I commence against, commit against myself. I think that I am punishing, punishing them by punishing myself uh, because I am allowing bitterness and anger to take root in my heart and that is only going to harm me. It's not going to do anything to them. You know, sometimes they are over there, you know, so happy and dali dali, uh, so, so happy. And here we are all resentful and all angry and all withering inside and having this cancer within our hearts, which is resentment and anger. So the only way that we can uh, get out of that prison is through forgiveness. We need to forgive and forgiving forgiveness is something that we do for our own good. Um, and so that's, that is a big, big area. I had no idea that it was a problem. Uh, and when I started coming uh, closer to God and I realized that it was a very, a very, a, a very essential part of being a Christian, the practice of forgiveness every day, uh, I, it was so, so freeing, so freeing uh, to let go of resentments and to let go of, um, of anger. And, uh, and so praise the Lord, that, that really does lead to, to a great deal of healing. Now there is the other area, not only resentment, not only sin and resentment, but there is the third area by which we place ourselves under the dominion of darkness, and that is the area of the occult, that is seeking knowledge and seeking power outside of God using spiritual uh, powers uh, that, that don't come from God. That is, um, <laughs> that is the bottom line. Uh, seeking knowledge, I am not talking, of course, about education and about science. I am talking about uh, looking for information or trying to, to find out uh, what's going to happen in the future or, or trying to have um, uh, clairvoyance, you know, to know things by occult practices. That is what I'm talking about. And I am talking about when seeking power is to, to have dominion over history, over time, and over um, nature, and even over other people, uh, but using, using spiritual forces that are not um, coming from God. Uh, that is uh, using the, the, the occult powers, you know, evil spirits uh, to, uh, to be clear. So what does the Bible say about this? Um, the Bible is very clear about this subject and I want to read from to you from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 beginning on verse 9. The context of this reading is, is this is the instructions that God gave Moses for the people of Israel just before they were to enter uh, the promised land. And in the promised land, there were many different pagan peoples which, which had their own gods and they had their own practices. And this is what the Lord is warning them, the Israelites, just before they enter to take possession of the promised land. And he is very clear and he is saying this to you as well. That is, if you are part of his people and if you are following Jesus Christ, if you belong to his kingdom. These are the instructions that the Lord gives us. When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, 
you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. Notice he calls them abominable practices, and we will see what it, what, what is, what it means. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. Now this verse is referring to the, the cult of Moloch. Moloch was one of the gods in, in antiquity, and one of the ways that they honor this god um, was by burning their their babies uh, in a furnace and offering them as a sacrifice to the god and this moloch uh, was supposed to give them prosperity if they were willing to kill their children in that way and uh, <laughs> you can say oh that that was a barbarous ba barbarian practice that that doesn't happen in our day of course if you are um, aware of our times, uh, you immediately made the connection probably in your mind with a, with a horrible scourge and evil that is abortion. Uh, because that is what it is. It is killing your baby uh, because you want prosperity for yourself. It is, it is a horrible thing, horrible, horrible thing. Uh, but um, but I, I would say that is the modern version of this cult of this demon Moloch, uh, that they would burn their children, their babies, as offerings uh, to to this god. You know. So, but the Lord is saying, you will not do this. You will not burn your son or daughter as an offering. And anyone who practices divination, divination, did you hear that? Soothsayer or augur, or sorcerers or charmers or a medium, or wizard, or a necromancer. He said, there should not be any of those uh, of those people in, in, in within you. Uh, you should not practice any of those things. Let me read them again. Divination, soothsayer, augur, sorcerers, charmer, medium, wizard, necromancer. We don't do those things. If we are following God, we should not ever, 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 ever get involved in this kind of practices. Whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. And then this is the instruction for you as a follower of God, as a follower of Christ. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess, give heed to soothsayers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God does not allow you such things. You know, that's, I mean, how much more clear, how much clearer can you be? You know, the Lord said, simply don't do it. Don't get involved in those kind of practices. And that, that is from the word of God, the word uh, from the from the book of Deuteronomy. And so we can see that it is very, very clear, the teaching of the Bible in this regard. We just don't get involved in those kinds of practices. Now, what does the Catechism tells us? The Catechism explains this teaching even more so in the numbers, the article numbers uh, 2116 and 2117. Here, the context in the Catechism is within the explanation of the first commandment, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, st your strength, with all your being, you shall love the Lord your God. You will not serve strange gods. You will not place any strange gods before me. And so in the context of the first commandment, he tells us that these kind of practices are against the first commandment. And, uh, and so let us read it from the catechism itself so that you know it's not, I didn't make it up. It is the teaching of the church and this is number 2116. It says all forms of divination are to be rejected, recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future, consulting horoscopes. Look, it's in the catechism, consulting horoscopes, astrology, Home reading, interpretation of omens and lots, the phenomena of clairvoyance, and recourse to mediums, all, all of these practices conceal a desire for power over time, history, and in the last analysis, 
over human beings. We just want to have power, to have advantage over other human beings when we uh, try to harness these uh, powers uh, to use them to our advantage and to our interest, uh, at the service of our interests. So it says, uh, as well, it also, con it also contains a desire um, and a wish to conciliate hidden powers, that is, to dominate uh, occult powers. And as I said, to put them at my service and my selfish desires, you know, and then th this is why they are wrong, because they contradict the honor, the respect and the loving fear that we owe to God alone and to God alone. We owe honor and respect and loving fear and obedience in not getting ourselves involved in any of these stupid practices. Okay, now there is the, the side of seeking power. This, the, the first paragraph deals with divination, seeking knowledge outside of God or, or using uh, spiritual powers, as they say, hidden powers. And then the second part is the use of magic or sorcery. It says all practices of magic or sorcery by which one attempts to tame occult powers so as to place them at one's service and have a supernatural power over others even if this were for the sake of restoring health, are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion. That is, magic, sorcery, and all these uh, occult powers that we are trying to harness and use for our own interest, even if it's even if the end is good, even if we are seeking something good, he says. It is, they are, all these practices, they are gravely contrary to the virtue of religion and they are even more to be condemned, says the Catechism, when they are accompanied by the intention of harming someone or when they have recourse to the intervention of demons, when you <laughs> openly ask the devil to do something for you. You know, that's, ah, that's horrible, horrible thought. You know, wearing charms is also reprehensible. You know, the people like those things, they're lucky charms, you know, but wearing charms is also reprehensible. Spiritism often implies divination or magical practices. The church, for her part, warns the faithful against it, recourse to so-called traditional cures, you know, like the traditional teas or remedies or or medicine, traditional medicine, you know, recourse to the traditional medicine does not justify either the invocation of evil powers or the exploitation of another's credulity. And that is, uh, there it is, you know, and it is right here in the explanation of the offenses against the first commandment. Uh, and so, <laughs> so it is more clear you cannot have it. Uh, so magic, sorcery, uh, divination, all those practices that we mentioned, even horoscopes and charms and all those kind of things, they have nothing to do with a Christian life. So we need to renounce those things, we need to let them behind and we need to confess if we have fallen into any of these practices. So that's what we need to do. We need, first of all, bring it to confession, repent of them, of course, bring it to confession and explicitly renounce all these practices. Say, uh, I renounce the practice of this, I renounce magic, I renounce sorcery, I renounce divination, I renounce all these practices. And we do that every Easter when we uh, renew our baptismal promises, uh, but sometimes we don't even know what we're doing. Uh, but we say, do you renounce Satan and all his works and all his empty promises? That's what it is talking about, that I renounce. Yes, I do. I renounce. And not, not do it again. If we have done it in the past, we repent, we renounce, and we don't do it again. And also another thing that we need to do is to destroy all the objects related to any of these practices, we, be it books or be it uh, charms or being uh, whatever we, we that are objects that are in our houses that are related to these practices. We need to destroy them and get rid of them. Uh, and also, if in charismatic circles, we also pray for deliverance. This is not exorcisms. This is deliverance. We we just receive the ministry of prayer. Uh, 
uh, to be delivered from the effects of these uh, stupid actions that we might have committed in the past. Uh, so one more thing that I, I think I forgot to mention is about the Ouija board, which is part of divination. But but to do it even by uh, as, a, um, as a game, even to do it just out of curiosity or even to do uh, not only the Ouija board, but anything, any of these practices, if we do them out of curiosity or, or if we did it out of uh, uh, ignorance or just, uh, uh, as I said, you know, as a game, uh, even if we do it that way, uh, there is still a uh, spiritual damage that happens to our souls if we, if we practice any of these things and we need to find remedies for the, the effects of these practices because uh, yes, maybe um, I was not very much at fault in the sense that if I was ignorant and I did it just out of stupidity, uh, <laughs> I then there may be not, not much blame, not much of a sin, but still there is a spiritual effect to, the, to those things and we need to find remedies for those things. And the remedies is of course the sacraments, uh, particularly confession, and also to renounce these things and also to receive a prayer uh, for healing and deliverance for these practices. Uh, so uh, this is it, this is, the, this is it for today. And um, uh, so you, you know what you need to do. And I, I pray for you and please do say a pray for me as well. And we'll see you next time. Uh, Arrivederci. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you.